What a wonderful morning already. Thank you so much for joining us today. So we do have a few announcements we just wanna, wanna let everybody know of, but first of all, for all of our esteemed guests, uh, especially if you're a first timer, thank you for taking time out of your schedule and being with us as we celebrate today just a major milestone in the life of our church, life of our community, and even in our own lives. Had a great time at our banquet last night, just reminiscing, reestablishing connections over the years, and that has already continued this morning and will continue as we go throughout the rest of today. So thank you for being part of today's worship service as all glory is to be focused to what God has done and is doing in the life of Grace Baptist Church. Um, as far as children's ministries today, we are asking that families worship together just because of the nature of what this is. This is a church family celebrating together. But if at some point during the service you feel you need to be dismissed, please feel free to do that. Um, we have some space out in the lobby you can sit with your child or we do have a couple of children's workers on tap ready to go. If they see you get up, they'll try and meet you in the lobby uh, to help take care of those things. We have some small handouts given to you so you can help your children pay attention throughout the service this morning. Um, but just wanna make sure you knew about those things. Next Sunday, we've gotta announce this. We will have a business meeting right after the service going over some things. So just wanna make sure you've got that on your calendar, church. And there will also be a missions crew meeting following the service next Sunday, just with some updates on our missionaries. So Brian and Tracy are leading that, probably in the classroom down the hallway. Is that the plan, Brian? All right. So we'll meet in the, in the classroom down the hallway after the service next Sunday for our missions crew meeting. Um, we're going to keep that to announcements today, but we do have a special presentation, uh, special announcements from Jake Carter. All right. We made this. <laughs> this is Ailish Clara Grace Carter. Um, she was seven pounds, 13 ounces, 20 inches long. She's been um, actually fairly, fairly nice for the most part to us. Um, I do want to say thank you to all the folks that brought us food. Um, Aaron's been able to focus on, on her, and I've been able to focus on the food. So that has been really helpful. But really, thank you to all. Um, we, those that have dishes at my house, they will be here next week, probably mislabeled. So we'll, we'll bring them by. But just uh, wanted to show her off a little bit, give her a little bit of a show. All right. What an exciting season. 50 years, and the generations continue. But let's begin our worship today with a word of prayer. I invite you to pray with me. Lord, we thank you that you are God alone, you are God above. And as we were reminded last night, you are a God that is faithful in all things and forevermore. Help our hearts to worship you truly with that perspective today. As we sit here today remembering friendships, stories, some good, some difficult, just that our focus will be drawn to your hands at work in our lives, in the life of this church, that we would see you high and lifted up as you're writing this story and drawing us into your work in the world today. Give us opportunities for fellowship to encourage and edify one another. Strengthen our hearts as we need that fellowship and help us to do all these things today, truly to glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We have a short presentation as we're getting things kicked off this morning. Thank you for being here.
Good morning. Um, my name, for those of you who don't know, is Jay McClaxton. Um, and as weird as it is, I think I'm one of the longer standing members of this church. Um, I've been here for 23 of 25 years. Um, and uh, it's been my family um, for all those years, um, kind of full circle for me. I was taught back there, and I'm now teaching back there. Um, but I've seen this church go through a lot of growth um, and a lot of um, messiness at the same time, um, but just uh, an amazing testament to God's faithfulness. And this building has changed a lot, um, and so this song has a lot of different characteristics about this building in it that I think were all true at one point or another, um, but it truly is about the family that's here. preaching the good news and those tattered old red hymn books have caught a tear or two cause it's hard to sing just as I am without the spirit moving you if those altars at the front could testify I know they'd say it never once got old hearing a sinner call his changed my life It never claimed to be the biggest and nobody ever called it cool but it's where my mom and daddy brought me to vacation Bible school It's been the picture perfect dream of a thousand glowing brides It's her sad goodbyes and I know this stained glass never saved a soul and these pews aren't on the roll that's called up yonder I know the pulpit's just a wooden stand but it's felt the power of God's hand as his glory filled the place with awe and wonder I know it's just a building place the building where Jesus changed my life. It's where I learned that Jesus hears my prayers and he's walking with me everywhere and no matter what I've done I know I'm loved. I'm always loved. And I know it was but I'll sure miss it when it's gone. And I'll be forever grateful to call this church my home. I know the stained glass never saved a soul. And these pews aren't on the roll that's called up yonder. I know the pulpit's just a wooden stand, but it's fair.
thank you for being here today. Um, I get the pleasure of introducing a young man that uh, when I came to this church, the Noonan family was one of the, the stables of this church at the time, and they had a little boy who, uh, well, we called him Christopher. He's outgrown that now. I don't know how you outgrow Christopher and shorten your name to Chris. But now he's Chris, so I'll call him Chris. But when I, when I came here, um, Christopher was a young man that, uh, well, he wasn't a young man. He was a little toddler, I think. But I, all, what I remember about Christopher was his mom and dad talking about his inquisitive nature, how at home that they would find him taking apart the vacuum cleaner just to put it back together. And it still worked. And... Uh, just a, a brilliant, brilliant mind that he had. I, I, I know he got that from his dad. It couldn't have been his mom. <laughs> but I love her, and Jesus loves her. But, um, but anyway, Christopher, as a young man, grew up in this church and um, was just one of those, those guys that you knew loved God. And he loved his word. And... Uh, he went off to college and went off to other churches, uh, was invested in by uh, somebody I'll mention later, and, uh, and Christopher's doing the work of the ministry today in Ohio. And uh, I don't know what role we had to play as, as a church in that, but any role that we had, I'm thankful for. And so Christopher, would you come um, share a, let me say it again, brief, Testimony, but he grew up with a pastor who didn't know what that word meant. So, thank you, brother. I think. Well, good morning. I uh, thank you, Carrie, for the the opportunity. Uh, I, I had texted Carrie uh, this week and had said just to confirm, uh, I have forty five minutes to share this morning, right? And and he said to me. Uh, in his text message, he said, four to five, maybe could spare seven. You go over 10 and brisket will be cold and people will be gone. <laughs> what he didn't realize is his fatal flaw was that he gave me the microphone first. So if your brisket is cold, it's not because I went long, it's because he went long in his preaching <laughs> later. So I'm going to do my best to summarize some of the first two-thirds of my life that was spent here at this church and the impact that grace had upon it in the next five minutes, but let's be honest, it's probably going to be 10, hopefully south of 15. Uh, so I'm going to take you on a little journey of just some of my, my time here at Grace. Uh, I was going to start you uh, in the nursery when I was being rocked there in 1993, but that's the 45-minute version, so we'll We'll scrap that and move on to, to some of the kids' ministry that I was involved in. Some of you probably remember G3, which was given God glory. Uh, that was the name of the children's ministry, or, or at least the class I was involved in at the time. And uh, it was there in that class, which is now the youth room out in the gym, that I memorized for the first time the, the books of the Bible. Uh, and I began to get my hands around this book. Uh, and then there was, there was Awana where I, I learned the, the priority and the importance of memorizing God's word and, and, and instilling that in, in my heart. Uh, I still remember uh, going out with my mom in the backyard to the, the swing set that is there, and we would go up into what I called the castle, and we would sit and work on my memory verses uh, together. Darren might remember this story, but one night in Awana, uh, I was instructed uh, before service. Now, Darren wasn't in on this. There was a different guy teaching the class, but he was teaching on Proverbs 26, 11, which is as the dog returns to his vomit, so does the fool return to his folly. And so I was instructed that while he was teaching that evening, I was to go figuratively vomit in the trash can. Uh, and then for those of you that know Ian Hauer, he was instructed before service to go eat what I had just vomited <laughs> in the trash can. So that trash had been exchanged for some broccoli cheddar soup uh, before Awana began that night. And so in the middle of teaching, I knew the key word went over and acted as if I was vomiting in the trash can. And Darren, out of great concern for my well-being, jumped up to make sure I was okay. 
but was then even more concerned when Ian got up and began to eat what I had just vomited <laughs> in the trash can. Uh, after Awana, there was youth group as I got older where the word of God was invested into me uh, in my years and the youth. And in, in youth group, I learned for the first time the difference between the will of God for my life and the plan of God for my life. And, and that's been an informative as, as I've walked with the Lord since then. I got to serve for a number of years uh, in the sound room back in the penalty box there in this room. And, and I learned that, man, we're all, we're all called to serve and that as a high school student, I had a role in the body. Uh, I had the privilege of interning at the church one summer. I got to see a window into just some of the, the sacrifices that Carrie makes to lead and to shepherd this body. Uh, we talked about faithfulness some last night, and over the 50-year history of Grace Baptist Church, Carrie has been here for over 25 of those years uh, and has been the senior pastor for 22 while I was interning, I happened to be the catalyst for a shirtless deacon meeting that I will spare you the details of. Uh, but if you're interested in that story, I will be around for lunch. Uh, lastly, I was afforded the opportunity uh, to start Grace Outreach uh, here at the church when I was in college, uh, a ministry that was focused on meeting some of the physical needs of, of our community so that we'd have the opportunity to, to provide the gospel and ultimately meet meet their spiritual needs. And so as I look back on that, that time that I was here, there's, there's three things that came to mind as far as lessons that I learned that were instrumental uh, in my life that I'd, I'd like to share. And the first is just the priority of the Word of God. Uh, as you noted with some of the things that I recalled, man, the, the Word of God was consistently invested into my life as a kid, and I, had, I got years uh, the privilege of sitting under excellent expositing of this book. Uh, and I learned that I can trust every single word that is in this book, and I have all of them in a book that I can hold in my hands. I don't just have God's thoughts. I have every single word that he has for me. I learned the necessity of discipleship. So not only was the word of God invested in, in my life as a youth and as a kid, man, I got to watch my parents as they took this same book and invested that book and that word into the souls of men and women so that those men and women that were invested in could take that same word and invest it into a second and third and, and fourth generation. I, I learned as believers that we are called to make disciples. And then lastly, I, I, I learned the importance of, of kids' ministry. Man, I was heavily invested in as a child here at Grace, and I'm, I'm forever grateful for that. Uh, from the things I mentioned to Kid Blast, which came later when I was a little bit older, uh, as a dad, uh, now myself and, and the leader of the children's ministry at our church in Ohio, uh, man, I'm, I'm learning a whole new appreciation uh, for the ministry to children. And so growing up here at Grace, those three things, the, the context of them, I, I, I learned all of this, all that matters, the word of God, the, the necessity of discipleship, and the, the importance of, of children's ministry. Uh, it all matters because I learned growing up here at Grace Baptist Church that, that there's coming a day where I will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm going to give an account for my life. Uh, and so what I do today and as I live my life in our church in Ohio and as I'm a dad and a husband, man, that, that matters. Because one day I'm going to give an account for, for how I've lived my life. Uh, and so I want to share with you just a quick passage of scripture. As, as I was studying through Joshua um, earlier this year and I, I came into Judges, I came to Judges chapter 2, which just absolutely arrested my attention. And so if you have your Bibles, you're welcome to turn to Judges chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, I'm going to read it so you can listen along if, uh, if you'd rather do that. Just setting the stage for what's going on, I, I, this is a church that's familiar with the book of Joshua, the book of Judges, right? So, so Joshua has led the people through Canaan, or sorry, across the River Jordan into Canaan. They're, they're in the Promised Land, 
taking ground for the kingdom, slaying giants, and living in all of the reality that God had for them. So we get to Judges chapter 2 and verse 7, and it says, And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance, in Timnatharis, and the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill of Gash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. So Joshua and that generation has, has passed. And it goes on, it says, And there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them up out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could no longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. And I read that passage not long before I was asked to take over the kids' ministry at our church, and just brought to my knees the reality of what that means for me as a father. Right, we know Joshua was slaying giants, they were taking ground for the kingdom, they were living in victory, and here we are in Judges on the heels of Joshua passing, and this generation has gone forsaken the Lord, gone after other gods, and not only are they not even slaying giants, they can't even stand before their enemies. And so I think for all of us that are dads in the room this morning, it, it ought to strike a healthy dose of fear in us, right? When I consider my, my kids and my role as a father, I, I consider what was invested in me here uh, as a kid at Grace, and it only takes a generation for that to be, for that to be lost. It only takes a generation to forsake the Lord and go a whoring after what the world has to offer. And so I, I think, like most dads in the room, would hope that our kids would stand upon our shoulders, right? I, I want Oliver and Joe and Elias to see more souls saved more disciples made, more lives transformed by the power of the gospel than I'm able to accomplish in my life. And so for those of you that are members of Grace Baptist Church today, uh, if I could just challenge you with this, man, 50 years, that's an incredible accomplishment. That's an incredible thing to celebrate. But that's a generation. And can I challenge you with this question, what are you doing personally to invest in the next generation? There is a generation some of them are here in this room this morning and some of them still outside of these four walls that, that need the same investment that I received as a child. And so can I ask you, how are you investing this book, the Word of God, into the souls of men? Why? So that that generation knows the Lord and the works that he's done. So that that generation can not only stand before their enemies, but they can, they can slay giants because they've been trained for warfare so that that generation might live in victory rather than defeat, and so that the hand of the Lord might be upon that next generation. So that ultimately that generation, if the Lord tarries, can stand before the Lord one day and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Uh, I have one final story and, and I'll be done. Um, the church we're involved in in Ohio, I think many of you are familiar with uh, First Baptist Church of New Philadelphia, Ohio, that heavily invested in grace uh, years ago. And so First Baptist Church has, has been around for over 165 years. The, the incredible reality that that church started in the Philadelphian church age is just a testament to God's faithfulness upon that body and their faithfulness to him. And so First Baptist Church planted our church in Columbus, Ohio, just over three years ago. And so uh, it's been super exciting. We, we bought a building in January and, 
have celebrated our third anniversary on church planting's hard work. It's messy, uh, but man, there's a lot of joy in the midst of it. And the sobering reality, though, is that that church that we bought the building from, they were 30 years old, and they ultimately failed in the mission. Uh, that generation was passing, and the church was slowly dwindling in membership until they ultimately had to, had to sell the building and close the doors. So that, that church's story is a sobering warning to our church in Ohio. Man, we've got to be faithful to the mission of reaching people with the gospel and making disciples, lest we wind up with the same exact story of that church that went before us. Because I know 30 years ago when they were building that building, there was a lot of excitement. Just like there's a lot of excitement at our church right now. But the reality is that even in Laodicea, the book still works. The gospel is still good news. And God is still in the business of saving souls. Amen? Amen. And so as Grace looks back on its first 50 years and looks ahead to the next 50 if the Lord tarries, uh, man, would God use each of you mightily uh, in the mission as you're faithful to it to see souls saved and lives transformed by the gospel uh, for his kingdom glory's sake. Thanks. Uh, give you the opportunity to get on your feet and we're going to join uh, together in uh, some praise and worship of our own uh, we pray that God will be pleased uh, by the sweet sound of voices uh, lifting his name in worship so stand together we're going to start with a, a great old hymn wonderful grace of Jesus Jesus, he 
Amen. sins. He forgives all of our sins. He forgets our sins more than we do. He forgets others' sins more than we do. And it's only because of his grace uh, that we're here. You know, we've been celebrating a lot about grace this weekend. We, we talk about this church in the context of Grace Baptist. But the gift of grace is not this church or this church body. It's, it's the gift of Jesus. That was the ultimate sign of grace. Let's sing together, yet not I, but Christ in me. What gift of grace is Jesus? 
Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold. Please. 
that any of the work that has happened here over five decades is not through our power and not through our success, but only through you dwelling in the lives of believers and being lived out and invested into others. Lord, I pray that as this church body continues in ministry, that our community and our neighbors around us would see us as the hands and feet serving them. Lord, that we can um, work outside the walls of this church building to reach others for your glory. It's all about your kingdom. And Lord, we know that none of that is done through and in ourselves, but only through the power of Jesus' blood, which has redeemed us. And we're so grateful for that. We pray that you're honored by the day, you're honored by the worship. And Lord, as we look at your word, that you'd be honored and we would get a better glimpse of who you are. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great worship. Why don't you greet one another around you? All right. Guys, i got to pull you back together a little faster than normal this morning. I know you like to ignore me during this time. I'm not going to let you. Um, we, we still have a lot to do, and, and I think, it, has it been pretty awesome so far? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Um, I, I want to do a couple quick introductions of some people. Go, could you bring the lights back up just for a second so that they can see these people? We have some, got, all of you who have come that aren't part of our church, we want to say thank you. Um, this day, if it was just us, would feel a little bit strange because you are the extension and many of you laid the foundation um, of this church. And so thank you for being here. I do want to acknowledge just a few special guests. Um, one of the uh, pastors of this church, um, who was only here for a short period of time, but had an incredible impact on the ministry here, Larry Bartlett. His wife, Mary, is here. Mary, where, would you stand, please? Mary, thank you. Um, I, I know he didn't think I was probably going to do this, but associate pastor here for a period of time. Alan Howe is here this morning. Where's Alan at? <laughs> Alan, thank you for being here this morning. Um, also a very, very special guest here this morning. Um, the very first pastor of this church, and I just learned this morning that the name of this church he was the one that gave this church its name Grace, and he is here with us this morning. Doug Gilliland, brother, would you stand? Thank you for being here. And I hope I'm not leaving anybody out, but I want to introduce our next guest who actually spoke to us last night, did a great job, a great challenge from God's Word, and he and his wife Susan are here Youth pastor for five years here at Grace, way back in the day, Alan Pierce. Thank you, brother. Would you come, please? Well, again, thank you once again. You guys have been so very kind to us uh, with uh, in the invitation, and, and it truly has been a blessing. And yes, we are old. 
<laughs> we, uh, we were here, uh, started in 86 and through 91. And I guess the way, uh, for, for me anyway, God used Grace Baptist Church to prepare us for the next journey. And because uh, I promise you, uh, when I got here, we got here in May, mm -hmm. uh, June, and my first duty as youth pastor was to take a group of teens to camp. <laughs> and so the pastor says, hello, good to have you. You're going to camp. And off we went. And, uh, and then from there, I had the privilege of doing almost everything from teaching, song leading, bus, junior church, and whatever else the pastor wanted. But God used all of that to prepare us for what was to come. While we were here, we learned about how important family is, how important the church is, because Grace Baptist Church was was there for us when we needed it the most. I'll let my wife explain that part. When we came, uh, little did we know that the five years we were going to be here, two of those years were going to be really, really hard. Um, we had been married five years, and at that point we decided it was time to have a baby. So we thought, okay, this, you know, it's going to be great. And I got pregnant. We went four and a half months, lost that baby. Got pregnant two months later, went six and a half months, lost that baby. And then two months later, I was diagnosed with cancer. And I uh, had a tumor plugged this ear shut, went half the width of my face, pushed up against my brain. At that point, they told us, you need to, you need to make your final plans and you know, the chances of you surviving this are almost impossible. And it was our Grace family that went through that with us. It was our teenagers who came alongside us. When we think about Grace Baptist Church, we think about them taking us through some of the hardest times of our life. They prepared us to be servants. You guys, we've only been with you a few hours, and we can still feel that. What an incredible thing. 33 years later for us to come back here spend just a few hours and still feel family. That is nothing but God. Nothing but God. It is an incredible thing to be able to see our old friends, to be able to love on them and to be with them. But it's just as incredible that we've made some new ones. And we thank you for the privilege of spending this anniversary with you guys. We are so proud to be a part, even though it's a small part, a part of this 50th anniversary. To have those five years, that will always be something we treasure. And we thank you for that. We thank you for being faithful. Please continue to be faithful. We again want to say thank you and as a result of our ministry here and what Grace Baptist Church did, uh, we went to Greenwood, Indiana and uh, candidated for a church. And as a result of that, we've been there for 33 years. And, uh, and we're just so thankful for what we learned here because of what God's done. So again, again church, thank you very much.
Hello everyone, I'm the token Brit of Grace Baptist Church, Sandra Nelson. I'm sorry and, and sad that I'm not able to physically share in the, the, the 50th anniversary celebration. Hopefully you'll all miss me. I'll miss you. Well, kind of. Being in England, though, is an okay excuse, though, um, don't you think? Hopefully you do. <laughs> I have asked Pastor Kerry if I could uh, write a little something in lieu of not being here that uh, he could read for me, as long as he read it out loud in an English accent. I still can't understand why he didn't think that's such a good idea, but um, he didn't, and so... Um, instead, you're stuck here um, watching this video. I uh, am not only the, the token Brit, I'm one of the new babies of, of Grace becoming a member not so long ago. Um, I sit over to the left in front of the behind me seat. As God is my father, this congregation are now my brothers and sisters. I've uh, attended many churches in my 74 years, but not one did I join until dear Darlene, my neighbor, said, uh, come to my church. I think you'll like it. And I came and I entered through the door, the door of grace that's a huge smile. A door that breathes love and, and joy and a door that you feel safe to open wide. And the door that whispers to you, child, your home. That door, that smile is a mere reflection of God's love emanating through the congregation of grace. It's truly amazing how much Genuine love and concern and caring is contained within these walls and it starts from the top. Our Lord, the Father, then through Pastor Kerry, Pastor Drew, down through them, the congregation, the family of grace. And it is such a true, true privilege being part of this family. Enjoy the festivities that have provided for you. But treasure, treasure the fellowship. Grace, happy 50, half a century. <laughs> and may the next 50 years be just as wonderful as these first 50 have been. Sandy, you can say Tally Ho. I will just say to you all, Bye, y'all. Bye-bye for now. No pressure. It's like the only thing I can do is mess this up now. Uh, you know, our church has been working on this event for about a year now. Um, a lot of effort has gone into it. Literally, our entire church has been involved in the planning, the prep, um, all the outworkings of everything you're seeing. Um, there, there are some people I want to thank. I did this last night. Pastor Drew was kind of the one that said, oh, about a year and a half ago, you know, we ought to do something special. 50 is coming up. And not only he come up with the idea, but so much of the behind the scenes stuff that uh, just tirelessly working. Um, Jeremy has been our our guy to bring it all together and make sure we stay on top of everything and just tirelessly worked, was over here last night bringing the sound stuff so you could actually hear things right today. Um, Angie, our secretary, has gone above and beyond. I can't even tell you. We should give her a month off. <laughs> We're not going to, <laughs> but we should. Um, the guy's doing the meal. Um, Jason, Luke, Denny, Linda, Jerry, all, you're going to really enjoy a meal after this. It's going to be amazing. Um, David and Mindy Ray, who 
Uh, David was in here the other night at 3 a.m. touching up paint in the hallway, doing painting the hallway. Mindy put together the little gifts, and if you didn't as a family or a couple or an individual get your gift, we have them for you. Um, I know I could list a lot of people. Those are just top of mind, but I, I just thank you all for being here. This has already been special. You know, in 1974, Richard Nixon was president for a few more months. Um, gallon of gas was 53 cents. The average household income was $11,000. The average price of a house was $38,000. A car cost $4,400. Inflation was 11%. So maybe it doesn't seem so bad right now. The Rubik's Cube was invented. Pocket calculators were making their debut. And a new show called Happy Days came out. How many remember Happy Days? Um, and on July 28th of that year, 98 people formed Grace Baptist Church. Now, these kinds of messages are, are tough for me. Um, as Christopher mentioned and others, we typically do expository preaching, and we just, we're usually in a book, and we just you know, ride that thing out and just say, here's what God said. Lately, we've been going over these things you see on the wall, who we are as a church, and therefore what we are to prioritize. We've been going through that. Next week, we're going to hit... Biblical discipleship. So this one's tough because it's kind of, where do you find the 50th anniversary in God's Word? And so I want to just do this today. I want to give you three things. And the first one is this. We're going to learn from the past, understanding where we've been. We don't even have a PowerPoint today, guys. You don't have a study sheet. Our people are going, what is going on? Um, just deal with it today, all right? Um, Deuteronomy 32.7 says this. Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Thy elders, and they will tell thee. You know, David, in Psalm 143, David is hiding in the caves at En Gedi as King Saul is chasing him, and he wrote these words. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all thy works. I muse on the work of thy hands. In one of the most difficult times in David's life, he says, I think of the days of old, God, when I know how you worked and I know how you showed up and I know you're going to do it again. And right after that, he wrote, Lord, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. We look back and we see those who laid the foundations of what we enjoy today. They did the hard work. They met when there was no building, limited resources, they trusted God and God was faithful. They met in a garage and then they came here and they, they bought a building and then they added on to the building. The auditorium you sit in right now was actually built by the members of the church. They added ministries, choir, youth group. Eventually there was young at heart. And God provided. And I want to ask you this. If you were here during those first 10 years, would you stand right now? Any time in those first 10 years, would you stand? Thank you for your faithfulness. <laughs> Kelly and I came to Grace in 1996, and for those of you who don't know, we didn't come as staff. We came looking for a church. And God in his sovereignty saw fit to bring us to Grace Baptist Church. I have no doubt he knew his ultimate plan. We were just looking for a church family because we'd come from a wonderful church family in Colorado. And we thought coming to the Bible Belt, man, we're coming back to Indiana where there's a Baptist church on every corner. You know, can I can just tell you there aren't that many like this one. And we're thankful God brought us here. When we came here at that time, um, there was a choir. We joined the choir. Warren Cummings was the pastor. Doug Dameron was the associate pastor. And we enjoyed the preaching, the fellowship, all that was going on. We joined the choir. And not long after joining here, we they did a uh, church cantata. H how many of you remember the King of Love? Wasn't about Elvis, okay? <laughs> um, and, and, you know, we, we joined the choir. Um, we got involved in the bowling league, the softball league, old-fashioned days. Then there was a WANA got started, um, and Pastor Allen, about a year after um, we came here, I was asked to come on staff. 
And I, I know when I was asked, my jaw went. Some of you are probably still thinking that. Um, but Pastor Allen, you know what my first duty was as youth pastor? Take the kids to camp. <laughs> what a rude awakening. Go to Camp Chautauqua and take these kids you don't know and they don't know you. But let me just tell you how God was sovereignly at work. Anybody that knows me knows I like air conditioning, right? <laughs> it's why it's a meat locker in here most of the time because these lights are about 15 degrees warmer than you are out there. But we go to camp, and my biggest concern is not the kids. It's not what we're going to do. My biggest concern is, I said, Kelly, how am I going to survive in a cabin with no air conditioning for a week? <laughs> we go to camp, and here's what happened. No kidding. We go to camp. First meeting, they said, Pat, youth pastor, we need you to come here for a meeting. Um, the camp is overflowing. We've got too many kids, too many youth groups. Um, we need some of you to go to a hotel. I volunteers tribute. <laughs> and I enjoyed the Hampton with our guys <laughs> at camp. And it was amazing. Um, in 1998, First Baptist Church of New Philly um, that Alan Howell was a part of, Pastor Mark Trotter, Pastor Frank Pardue brought discipleship to our church. And it did change the trajectory of our church and how we approach the Word of God. Eventually, there were mission trips to the Philippines, and I think it was 2000, 2001, um, and we saw dozens of people come to, the cri to Christ in another part of the world. If you were on one of those mission trips, would you stand right now? So these people were faithful in taking the gospel to another part of the world. In 2006, we saw God supernaturally protect and provide for this church. Um, this auditorium you're sitting in, we came in and we were noticing at the time there was a drop down ceiling up here and it was separating from the roof line. A crack was forming right in the middle up here and we had an engineer come in and he said, um, don't meet in this building next week. It might come down. Now, I don't want to blame any of you those of you who built it back in the early days, but you did build it. No. <laughs> Here's how God supernaturally worked. About nine months before that, we started a children's ministry called Kid Blast. And we had guys spend about six months building a stage out in the gym for our children's ministries that many of you saw this morning. How, how many of you, well, I'll stop, hang on. We built that stage, and we had just been on that stage a few weeks when an engineer says, you can't meet in here. And we were like, no problem. We got a stage out in the gym. Thank you, God. You provided. We were in the midst of talking about remodeling the auditorium. So we came to the church. We said, guys, here's the deal. We got to bring literally jacks in here and jack up this ceiling. We had a huge beam up here. We had um, cables tied to the outside walls and pulled them in because the walls were going like this as the trusses were pushing out because those trusses were failing. We had to go up in the attic, and as per the engineer's instruction, we had to put three-quarters inch plywood on both sides of the trusses, drill 23 holes, put 23 lag bolts through, nuts, bolts, all this stuff, just to fix that. And then we said, what do you want to do with the auditorium? Because we've got to rip the pews out to just get to this. And the church said, you know what? Let's just remodel the auditorium while we're at it. Well, guys, you need to understand, we don't have the money. We just spent 40000 on a stage out there. Really don't have the money for it. Um, but, guys, if you want to get to work, we'll start working, and we'll work as God provides the funds. Nine months later, this baby was born. God not only sovereignly knew what was going to happen and had a plan beforehand, he provided every dollar we needed to have this space, and we didn't borrow a dime. Praise the Lord. That is our God. There are no coincidences. And just in the last few years, God supernaturally provided through the sacrifice, giving, I don't even know what to call it, the outside of our building, I don't even know what it cost because most of it was given as a gift. Those of you who had seen the outside of our building just five years ago, 
was old stone. We were going to need to tuck point. It was failing. We actually had mold inside of the walls. We were wanting to do a circle drive and, and have a place to drop people off out here. And God provided it all through the sacrifice and giving of his people. We're so thankful for what God has done. We've seen weddings of our children happen in this room. We've seen, as Christopher said, our children grow up in this church. We've seen babies born into our family like we just had this past week. We've had five in the last year. Guys, we need more nursery workers. <laughs> Many of you have been baptized right back here or back in the day, it was right back there. More importantly, in the last 50 years, we've seen people come to know Christ and grow in their faith. We've seen missionaries sent out, and we've seen scores of people. Some of the people, folks that I discipled who are staying, uh, and Kelly disciples staying with us this weekend, are serving the Lord faithfully in Evansville right now and sat on our patio yesterday talking about wanting to go, where was it again, Ecuador? Guys, that's God. And the, the branches and fingers of Grace Baptist Church aren't just in this room and not in this building. God has been faithful, and he's been gracious. We actually have a couple right now. How many of you remember Jake and Jen Blackburn? Raise your hand. They couldn't be here this morning, and part of that reason is that he is being voted on this weekend to possibly become on staff at their church in Noblesville. Praise the Lord. So now here's the thing. Unlike a Hallmark movie, we do like to keep it real. It's not all been purdy. There have also been some difficult times here at Grace. We've seen some folks that we love seemingly just walk away from their faith. And we tried to bring them back, and they haven't come back. We've had to remove people from our church membership because of unrepentant sin. We've seen marriages, the purpose of which God says that the wife is to picture the bride of Christ, the church, and the husband is to picture Christ, and this union is to picture the relationship of Christ and the church and the unbreakable covenant of that, and we've seen marriages shattered. As has been mentioned this weekend, we've seen leaders Good men who stood in this pulpit who loved God and who were doing a work for God with the intent of leading his people and they fell into sin and the snare of temptation. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now guys, when you read that scripture, you need to understand something. One, two things are true. One is, is that Jesus is ultimately going to get the job done. Amen? He is going to build his church, sometimes through us, sometimes in spite of us. He is faithful when we are not. Those charter members didn't build this church, and we're not building this church now. Jesus Christ is building his church in this place. Number two, you need to know this. If Jesus is building his church, the enemy is going to do everything he can to work against that. He wants to destroy marriages. When the Bible says in 1 Peter, he is like a roaring lion, stalking, looking to whom he may devour. What he is doing is he wants to destroy your life, destroy your marriage, destroy your home, destroy your kids, destroy this church. Because God is trying to build something, and his enemy is going to come against it. He wants to destroy the lives of leaders and their families and those who look to their example. Guys, ultimately what he wants to do is destroy God's reputation on this planet. The God who deserves worship and glory and our very lives, the enemy wants to tell the lost world, that's a joke. The enemy said in Job, he came to God and said, um, do you have anybody that serves you just because of you? And God said, have you considered my servant Job? Guys, do you realize the theme of the Bible that so many people say, oh, the theme of the Bible is salvation. The theme of the Bible is not salvation. The theme of the Bible is the glory of God. And there are two kingdoms. Satan's trying to, 
to build his and God is building his and those two are opposed. And so understand what happens when God's people fall is that just like in David's case who we'll talk about with his sin with Bathsheba, listen, what Nathan said to him was this, you have given the enemies of God occasion to blaspheme. Do you understand your sin and mine isn't just about us and our consequences? It's about what is being said about our God in heavenly places. So guys, here's the thing. We need to understand that they say that the only thing that men learn from history is that men don't learn from history. Well, we had better Number one, we need to do this. Number one, stay humble. Stay humble. I do want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So here's our exposition this morning. There's a warning here that Paul says to the Corinthian church, which was a messy church. And can I just say this? Any church is a messy church. We talk about sins of the past. Guys, there are sins right now, today, in this church. We are human beings who are frail and we fail. And yet God is still faithful. But a church is a messy thing. There is no church that is perfect and there will not be. But we need to understand this. In 1 Corinthians 10, chapter, chapter 10, verse 1, Paul said this, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. They had seen God open the Red Sea, cause them to go through on dry ground, provided for them in the wilderness. They've seen God's supernatural hand guidance and provision and yet watch what happens. Verse 5, but with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. But by the way, guys, the promised land of the Old Testament is not heaven for us. Because not everybody got there. We believe that if you're saved, you're eternally saved and you'll wind up in heaven. But here's the thing, the promised land of the Old Testament is the abundant Christian life where we glorify God of the New Testament. And he says some of them didn't get there. They were overthrown in the wilderness. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat, they drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Have any of you, have, have I, ever watched by God do supernatural wonders in my life and then gripe and complain about what he's doing in my life today? How dare we? But we do. Now all these things happened unto them for in samples and they are written for our admonition. Do you ever look at the children of Israel and go, how could they do that? Do they not believe the same God who did this for this? Uh -huh. Let it be a warning. They are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. And here it is, guys, verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. None of us should ever look at our fallen brothers or sisters or whomever and look down our noses and go, <laughs> how could you do that? I'll tell you how. Because David did. Guys, when you take a man after God's own heart, the David that we would look to, and man, he took on Goliath. He had the faith. You know what David said? David said, how do you let the armies of the enemy blaspheme the God of the army of Israel? How are you letting that happen? And he said, I will stand and fight this giant. And he's the same one that splish, splash, he was taking a bath. David saw her, he took her, he committed adultery, then he lied about it, and then he murdered to try to cover it up. 
if it can happen to David, don't any of us dare ever say, well, I would never. We better stay humble. Abraham, a man of faith, a man who God said, I want you to leave where you're at and go to a country you don't know and you've never seen and you just go. And Abraham said, I'll do it. The God who said, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your, your son that you love, and I want you to take him on a mountain and you sacrifice him there. And Abraham said, all right. Really? And then that Abraham in a moment of weakness when he's going to Egypt with his wife, he says, hey, honey, tell him, Tell them you're my sister so it'll go well with me. That's Abraham. What about Peter? Peter, the one who had just been the one to step up and Jesus said, Whom say ye that I am? And Jesus says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, man, upon your confession, upon this rock, I will build my church. The same Peter that later Lord, though all these chumps, they might flee you. I'll never flee you. Um, Peter, do you know him? Uh-uh. Peter, isn't, uh, weren't you one of his disciples? Uh-uh. Peter, don't you? I mean, I'm sure you were with him. Blankety, blank, blank. I don't know him. Peter? Don't be lifted up with pride, guys. If it can happen to these guys, it can happen to us. And listen. What that tells us is this, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Proverbs 4, 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. These things typically don't just happen in the spur of a moment. It happens because we allow our heart, our heart to be drawn away from Christ, and we slowly, there's a song that says, it's a slow fade, and then you give your life away. Guard your heart. For out of it flows your life. So guys, we need to learn from the past, the good and the bad. Secondly, we need to live in the present, understanding where we are. How do we get here today? Um, you know, we celebrate 50 years. Some of you who were here in those early days probably look around and go, golly, what, what happened around here? Is this the church? Is this still the fundamental church that we started 50 years ago? You know, I had a lot of good conversations about that this weekend. Faces have changed. The building has certainly changed. There used to be orange carpet in here. <laughs> now there's stained concrete. There used to be chandeliers. Now there's can lights. There used to be pews. Now there's chairs. Oh, my goodness, they've gone the way of the devil. Where there once was a nursery, there's a coffee shop. When I came in 1996... They played a piano and organ. We had hymns in the morning, and in the evening we had the audacity to break out an overhead projector, set it right there in about pew number two where John Weaver is, and set it on a stand and show a slide projection on a drop-down screen, and we sang praise choruses. And somebody started to play a guitar, and then, oh my goodness, we had a pastor who was actually a college drummer, and he started playing his drums. Back then, there were mostly ties and jackets and dresses, and now there's a mixture of everything from this to shorts and T-shirts. The church in the early years was Sunday school, worship, Sunday night, Wednesday night prayer. Now the church, we have equipping hour, then we have worship, and then we have small groups that meet every, almost every night of the week, some here at the church, some in homes, just all over the place. And we get together one-on-one -on -one and disciple. So are we still the fundamental church that was birthed in 1974? Yes and no. Yes and no. We are not the same in that our methods have changed, our music has changed, and certainly the people have changed. But we still believe the same doctrines. If you looked at our doctrinal statement, it's pretty much exactly what you probably subscribed to 50 years ago. We believe God is still the creator of all. He created it all in six days. 
and then rested on the seventh. He is a trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe this book is God's infallible word. Every single word of it has been preserved for us today. Amen? And we stand on this truth. We believe Jesus Christ is God, and he is also God's Son, and that he died on a cross for our sin, and that men and women and children today are saved simply by putting their faith in what he did on the cross, plus absolutely nothing. That's what we believe. And we believe in a literal heaven and a literal hell. And we believe everybody's going to spend eternity in one of those places. We believe Jesus is coming again and we believe he's coming again soon. So guys, listen. If you want to know whether we're still fundamental, if those are fundamentals for you, that's who we are. I want to have you turn to Colossians chapter 2. Because here's the thing that will happen. Some of us today, in the way our church is, we might say, well, we like our church the way it is today. Some people like the church the way it was 50 years ago. Well, what if the Lord tarries and somebody like me in about 20 years is still here? Will I like what I see? Will this be the church that I would prefer? You know, Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 says this, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You believed him by faith. You live your life by faith. It's all about that. Rooted and built up in him. Know, know what you believe. Established in the faith as you've been taught. Abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men. After the rudiments of the world. Not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him. Which is the head of all principality and power. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein you're risen with him through faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. He blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in these things, meat or drink or in respect of a holy day over the new moon or the Sabbath. All of those things were a shadow of the things to come, but the body is Christ. And guys, sometimes we get caught up in how this church does things or this church. Guys, we don't think that the way we do it's the only way that's right. It's the way we do it. But we do it based upon the truth of God's word. And we worship him not just in spirit, not just authentically, but according to truth. And so guys, who we are today is a church that still believes all the things that this church has always believed. But guys, the building has changed, the faces have changed, the music has changed. But guys, we still hold to the one who is building his church here. Traditions are nice, but truth is the standard. Preferences are fine, but they don't define holiness. Methods can change, but the message cannot. If the Lord tarries 25 years from now, I can assure you I won't be the pastor. I can assure you these chairs will probably be gone, the carpet will be different, and most of the songs we sang today will not be the ones they sing then. The success of a church's ministry is not the programs they have or the good worship music they have or the size of the building or even the number of the people. It is this. Have they been faithful to God and His Word? Guys, that's what makes Grace Baptist Church a success. Our methods don't change lives. Our message does. Romans 1.16, Paul said this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And what I want to do is ask Kelly and Darren to come now. We're going to sing a song that hopefully will bring this point home. And it's entitled, It's Still the Cross.
long, awkward pause. <laughs> It's not conservative or liberal, however they're defined. It's not about interpretation or the judgment of the mind. It's the opposite of politics, power or prestige. It's about a simple message. And whether we believe it's still the cross, it's still the blood of Calvary that cleanses sin and sets the captives free. It's still the name, the name of Jesus that has power to save the lost. It's still the cross. It's still the cross. We can water down theology and preach a word to suit our needs. We can justify sweet, subtle lies that are wrapped in noble deeds. We can alter our convictions to adapt to social whims but we cannot change the gospel or the truth contained within it's still the cross it's still the blood of calvary that cleanses sin and sets the captives free it's still the name the name of Jesus that has power to save the lost. It's still the cross. Though some may say it's man's religion or ancient history, the cross of Jesus still remains the price for sin that sets us free. It's still the cross, it's still the blood of Calvary that cleanses sin and sets the captives free. It's still the name, the name of Jesus that has power to save the lost. It's still the cross, it's still the cross, it's still the cross. finish with a look to the future, understanding where we're going and what it is we are to do. You know, I'm going to summarize the book of Ephesians as quickly as I know how to do it. We spent two and a half years going through the book of Ephesians, and I'm going to try to do it in five. You know, it was an incredible book that Paul wrote to the church. What did I say? Five Not five years. <laughs> Minutes. Chapter 1 in the book of Ephesians, here's what Paul writes to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, you have all these spiritual blessings in Christ. You have been chosen by God. You have been accepted in the Beloved. We're accepted by God because He accepted His Son's sacrifice on our behalf. We were adopted as children of God, brought into the family of God. 
We are sealed by the Holy Spirit, so we can't lose what we have in Christ. We have an inheritance reserved in heaven for us. And guys, at the end of chapter 1, he talks about this power that is, that, that is available to all of us as children of God. That's what we have. Chapter 2, he starts telling us, here's why you have it. He says, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You had not a thing within you that in any way, shape, or form had spiritual life. We were all, every one of us, come short of the glory of God, and we were sinners destined for eternity apart from Him. But God, who is rich in mercy, hath quickened us together, made us alive with Christ. How did that happen? Chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And then he says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So what we don't do is say, well, I got salvation, I'll see you on the other side. If you're a true believer, let me tell you, what God does in your life is you say, now I am to give my life for him because he gave his life for me. Chapter 3 Here's, here's what he does. Paul says, let me explain about this mystery of the church. That the Old Testament, there were all kinds of pictures back there of the church, but they didn't understand because for the Jews, it was all about them, right? They're God's people. And God gets here, and with the cross, it says that he brought those two, Jew and Gentile alike, into one body. The mystery of the church is that now God's people, his people that he called his people, are now in the same spiritual body that those of us who were alienated by God, Gentiles, and now he says, you are part of this thing called the church. But here's what I want you to see. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10, he tells us why he did it. Guys, please understand this about your salvation. I said the theme of the Bible was not salvation. Oh, salvation is woven throughout scripture don't get me wrong but you need to understand why jesus saved you it wasn't just so you could go to heaven when you croak and that's what a lot of people do man i got my salvation now i can live my life the way i want and i'll see jesus on the other side because i prayed a prayer right down here you need to understand this in ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10 god tells us why he saved us and put us into this thing called the church. Look at it. To the intent that now, here was his intent, that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Here was his intent, that by the cross, reconciling lost people to himself and placing them in a family, that now God has his people all over the world sharing about his son so that the principalities and powers his enemy in heavenly places and angels that don't understand grace would go wow is their god wise guys ephesians chapter 3 if you'll look at it with me i said five minutes where am i at I want you to read with me, starting in verse 11. He says right there, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Guys, the church is bigger than us. Your salvation is more than just about you. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him whereof. Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees. Paul prayed, I believe, for us, unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus Throughout all ages, world without end. And somebody say amen to that. 
Guys, what he does in chapter 4 is he says, now here's how you do that. I therefore, as based on that, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you called. How many of you have a vocation? It's your job, right? He says, as a believer, as part of the church, this is your job. Walk worthy of this job. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Guys, it's unity. God says, part of our job is to maintain the unity that we have as believers in Jesus Christ. We don't create it. He created it at the cross. Our job is to not destroy it. He goes on, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. And then what he talks about is spiritual gifts that every single one of us have. If you're saved, you've been given one, and it's supposed to be utilized within the local church to build up the body of Christ. And I'll finish with this. Verse 11, he says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and pastors, I'm sorry, evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why did he give those men? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Do you understand what God did when he saved you? Is he saved you to conform you into the image of his Son whereby he might be glorified. And this is called his Son's body on the earth today. That's who we are to be. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. Do you know why you believe what you believe? Please don't say, that's just because my pastor says that. You better know what the Word of God says and why you believe what you believe. By the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him in all things, which is the head. Guys, here's our future. We're going to love one another and maintain what we have in Christ. We are going to have pastors continue to preach this book. Others preach and teach this book so that we are equipped to know what we believe. We won't be tossed around with all kinds of doctrine. We'll stick to what 50 years ago this church was founded upon. And then thirdly, we're going to invest that in one another as the saints do the work of the ministry of building up others in Christ, getting together one-on-one in groups, wherever it is that we help other people become more like Christ. That's what we're going to do till Jesus comes. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this church. I thank you for what you have done here, what you're doing here, and what you are going to do here. Lord, how we pray that you would come. We pray that Jesus would come even before this service ends. But if he tarries another 50 years, as Christopher said, Lord, I pray that this church would be found faithful, that that we would raise up the next generation all for the purpose of bringing glory to the one who created us and saved us, and we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. In a world full of broken dreams Where the truth is hard to find For every promise that is kept There are many left behind And 
know it seems that nobody cares it still matters what you do because there's a difference you can make but the choice is up to you will you be the one to answer to his call will you stand when those around you fall will you be the one to take his light into a darkened world tell me will you be Sometimes it's so hard to know who is right and what is wrong. And where are you supposed to stand when the battle lines are drawn? But the Lord, He keeps calling out. For someone who's not afraid To be a beacon in the night To a world that's lost its way So will you be the one To answer to his call Will you stand when those around you fall will you be the one to take his light into a darkened world tell me will you be the one there's still some battles you must fight from day to day but the Lord provides the power for me to stand and say I'll be the one to answer to his call. I will stand when those around me fall. I will be the one to take his light into a dark and Will you be the one? I will be the one. Yes, I will. has surely been a good morning. As we think of that word, goodness, I think back to creation when God looked at everything he'd done and time after time after time, he said it is good. And as we go on through the rest of today, we have more opportunity to experience goodness. And as we were just reminded, our greatest goodness we have is to carry that message forward. Like Joshua said, to not be concerned with what everyone else chooses, but as for me, for my house, we will serve the Lord. So as we bring things to a conclusion this morning, I wanted to look at a couple of psalms as we close in prayer. Psalm 27, verses 1 through 5. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, come upon me to eat my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against, my, against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise up against me in this, will I be confident? One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And then in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Verse 8, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the privilege, the honor it is to gather today and reflect over 50 years of history of this church. Throughout these times, we've seen how the church has displayed these different attributes of coming together as a family and sharing this bond and this closeness, the delight to be together. At times, the difficulty of togetherness, but God, you have brought that family to be. We thank you for the recognition that we all bow before you and we look to you as our great shepherd and as your flock, you have led us both through valleys of darkness and through pleasant pastures. Lord, we rejoice in the work you have done. As a body, you brought us together with all our different backgrounds, our stories, our needs, our characteristics, and formed something unique in this unity. Though we are all different, different, we rejoice in the one true God that we worship above all. And Lord, we also rejoice in how you've showed your love to us as your bride, pouring out your love at the very greatest expense of heaven to show us you love us, that you care, and you call us your own. As we look back over these last 50 years and celebrate what has been, Lord, would you help us to have that heart attitude, that resolve, that says above all else, Lord, you are who I seek. Though men shall fail, Lord, you will never fail. Help each of us to follow you regardless of what comes, that should 50 years from now come to be, we will still be able to rejoice and say that we have tasted and we have seen that, Lord, you are good. Thank you for the time this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. It's been an awesome morning. I know it's been a long, long morning. Woo. I know it's been a long morning. So uh, we want to wrap this up with a song, a fun song. It's a, it's a clapper, a tapper, maybe even a foot stomper, okay? And it's not lost on me that we're Baptists, okay? So, you know, rhythm can be this fleeting ability sometimes. But let's stand together. We're going to sing about no matter what dec decade you were a part of Grace Baptist Church, we are the people of God, and we want to serve him continuing on. some good eating out there. We got smoked brisket, we got smoked pork. I've been told that there are two serving lines, so we're going to close in prayer here, ask a blessing on the meal, and uh, you can just grab a plate and head toward the line, okay, when you get out there. So we are so grateful uh, for those that made an effort to get here. I know some travel uh, far and wide to get here. Great to fellowship. We'll continue that out in the gym. Let's close in prayer and ask God's blessing on it. Father, we are grateful uh, for your love and your faithfulness to us, to this church body. Lord, we thank you for the great meal that we're about to enjoy, all the preparation that's gone into that, the way you've provided for this body over and over through the years. Uh, we pray your blessing on the fellowship, that our conversation would be uplifting, and that you'd be honored through it all. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen.